Spartans to the latest podcast evolved book club. I am your host, Krista, so you know it's going to be a good one. And with me today is Aaron. Hi, guys. And David. Hello, everybody. And this time we're talking about something very dear to my heart. Very exciting to talk about. We're talking about Halo Ghosts of Onyx, probably one of the most important books that we've kind of gotten throughout the Halo series. It's It's got a lot of stuff in it, a surprising amount of stuff. So uh, the author is Eric Nyland. Very nice. Uh, publisher is Tor Books. Formats available, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. The release date was October 31st, 2006. Oh, that's right. It's an oldie. Oh, it's so old that the pages have started to get that yellow, yellowing on them. <laughs> the book is so old. <laughs> uh, the length is 383 pages, which is a very short length for the amount of stuff that's in this book. I always forget how much stuff they just smash into this book. We're going to tackle this because there's so much stuff in the book. We're trying going to try to tackle this in a couple, a different fashion than usual. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the intro slash the Spartan 3 project. Because Ghost of Onyx is all about the Spartan threes. Just initial thoughts about coming back to Ghost of Onyx after all of these long years. Go, Aaron. God damn it. You guys got to get more excited. I, I, I didn't want to talk over David. Excuse me for being polite, Krista. Yeah, Krista. I want screaming. This is an exciting time. My, uh, right. Okay. My initial thoughts for coming back to this is kind of like happiness and sadness all at the same time because I find the Spartan threes awesome but really sad. And I w reminded the whole way through this how shitty a lot they have in life. But it is a really good book at the same time. And Kurt's an awesome character. Also, this is like, is the, was this like the longest cliffhanger in the lore we ever had? Because yes. pretty we had to wait yeah. until the Karen Travis books to get any... Oh, well, I suppose this and Grey Team, isn't it? These are the two big yeah, cliffhangers I, Grey, we've had Grey for Team years. Grey Team might be longer. I think Grey Team was longer. I think it was over 10 years. I could... Yeah. This would have. I th this was one of the the last Bungie books, was it? This or is the this fourth like the book, but I don't think it's the last Bungie because I think Cold Protocol came out and then so did. What was this? Contact Harv Harvest. Harvest. Yeah. They're both Bungie books. So it was six years between this book and Glasslands. That's a that's a pretty long time, yeah. It's a decent amount of time, but yeah. considering the amount of time they were actually stuck there, I mean. It's pretty pretty similar time span. Then again, they weren't stuck there as long. The spoilers for Glasslands. That's true. Time moves quicker on one side than the other. We we'll get to that later. But overall, I I forgot how much I liked this book. I did realize as I was going back through it how much stuff I'd forgotten that happens in it. Yeah, because me I too. I thought I had a fairly good memory. I was thinking like, okay, there's all the stuff at the start with blue team then kurt goes off then kurt makes some spartans uh, then they go into the middle of onyx and they all live happily ever after i forgot about all the <laughs> stuff in the middle yeah yeah i felt the same way i knew the basic story but i didn't remember all of the small details that happened the space battle that that entire space battle that takes place uh, in, in like the onyx system i completely forgot that existed with uh, richard lash and his prowler I totally yes. forgot about that character, by the way. I'm like, who the hell is this again? Because at one point, one of the chapters um, veers off and starts talking about him. And I remembered, I remembered like one of the elites being one of the main characters, but I didn't remember Richard, Richard Lash at all. Because he's just like, he's he's got like two or three chapters where he just kind of sits on the sidelines and is like, ah, shit, what the fuck? Yeah, I'd forgotten about that as well. I always mixed up that the intro of the Spartan Trees that there was... Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, that there was three. I thought there was more. And I obviously always mixed up the Alpha and Beta missions with each other. In terms of, like, I mm -hmm. know one is, like, one was a complete success and they all died. And one was a partial success, I think, with Tom and Lucy being the only two survivors. For some reason, I always get them blended up. One is, like, a shipyard and one is, like, a dock or something. Or is one... One where they make plasma? Is that where I'm mean, even right now? Yeah, it's like a up. factory. It's a plasma factory, and that's the that's the um, betas that go to the alpha fa that go to the <laughs> the factory. The factory. Okay. Let's start. Let's start with Colonel Ackerson because he kind of puts the um, puts every piece and kind of starts this uh, starts this story with his idea to 
make Spartan 3s, make Spartans cheaper, kind of less effective, but just as effective, but just make a bunch of them. He's just like quantity over quality. Let's just make a bunch of freaking Spartans because Alpha Company had what 300 and that was the first um Yeah, Spartan all of 3s. them work out being like about 300 per sort of unit, but they had I I like the bit at the start when they talk about it where they had such grand visions about how they were going to like multiply the Spartans and they were going to start off with 300 and then like the second class was going to be 1000 and the third class would be 10000. And they, they, they had this vision that in like 40 years time, they were going to have 100,000 Spartans. And you're just like, Jesus, 100,000 Spartan threes in 30 years would be a uh, overkill for humanity. I suppose they kind of get there in the end with Spartan fours, but still. This is definitely the, um, the turning point with the Spartan program, taking it away from Catherine Halsey, who wants everything perfect. I mean, she's a perfectionist. Hand has to hand pick everyone, make sure everything's perfect, raise them while they're very, very young, make sure all these augmentations are perfect. And the Spartan 3s are kind of just the, let's find some orphans, let's let them volunteer, let's do as much as we can with the limited budget we have, and then we send them out. It's this kind of, it's, they're the important building block where they go from, like you had the Spartan 2s were, oh, the good sizable 50%, 60% of them got really fucked up with the augmentations to where... I think it was 75%. They lost like 75% of the company. Yeah, and by the time you get to the Spartan 3s, I don't recall them mentioning any washouts in any of the three classes. Like, they all I think make it they through all the graduated because I think... Didn't they? They have limited numbers, so I think they may have like... I don't know on the alpha and beta, but I remember when they were talking about making the gammas that they didn't force the washouts just to just to have me a uh, arbitrary number so they actually had more than they were meant to have but like they didn't have anyone that fell outside like the genetic criteria which is really where like they jump from there to the spartan 4 program where they can now turn anyone into a spartan so like it it's probably cool that they put this in the lore because now we can have unlimited spartans because we were sort of running a bit thin on spartan 2s for a long time oh yeah I I do I love the differences between them and even their backgrounds and how they're all created that now we've got like three classes of Spartans. You've got the ultra rare legendary fighters of Spartan twos. Then you have the Spartan trees, which are kind of the crazies, the kind of the wild ones. And then they're, they're like almost like things that like Oni's ashamed of, so they're all hidden. So I love the stories that bring in the, these characters back that they started in this book, but when they bring them back, it's in different ways. And I love and obviously the four is like the super. In front of everybody, it's super public. Everyone thinks it's amazing. Do you know what I mean? It's its own Anyone branch. can get into the program. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it all started with this book, which is crazy to think how old it is. And the amount of stuff in it that is still kind of relevant. And, like, you just don't think about it, but, like, it all happens or started with this book. Well, think about this. This I think this is the first time we ever see Perengoski in a book. Is it? Yeah, you see her at the very beginning. You don't see anything else, but this book doesn't really illustrate how important she is yeah she's in it once or twice but i don't think was she in no was she in fall of reach this is her first appearance her, i'm looking up it the book is, on wikipedia on right. halopedia it's her first appearance she does come across as a kind of um scary person everything yeah everything before that halsey only really dealt with section three like then they don't really describe too many higher ups no you don't that's true even though they like they build it into the backstory later that it is all all parangoski's doing but i I never put two and two together this was the first time we meet her because she's such a developed character now through the kilo five books oh yeah when i first read this book i just all i kind of just oh that's that's a person and just kind of went on with it funny when we were listening to it the th- when i was listening to it the thing i noticed was i don't think at any point kurt ever knows who she is for a long time because when he first meets them he only realizes that she's this like admiral in the corner no one ever addresses her by name in front of him uh, honestly i think she would want it like that though I, I don't think it's till much later that she like figures out who or that he he would know who she is so oh that's interesting i really like kurt <laughs> like yeah. I really like him. He's so different than any of the other Spartan twos. He's he's almost a little bit more human than them. Oh, completely. He seems to be like the one who came out. I guess you could say normal 
and they really kind of describe him as that and they really detail him as build him as like this unique spartan too and that like he would spend time getting to know people around him and stuff when all the other spartans were like totally withdrawn i mean he's he's super unique in that way He's the social one. He's the one who doesn't have this social stigma. Because yeah. I feel like a lot of the other Spartans just don't know how to deal with non-Spartans. And Kurt just really does a good job throughout this whole book dealing with future Spartans and just random people that he meets. Like, even the moment he's taken away from Blue Team, because Ackerson at the beginning decides that he wants Kurt to lead to... Because he wants Spartans to teach Spartans, so he decides to pick Kurt, and obviously they have to stage Kurt's death. So Blue Team go on a mission that's completely set up. Kurt has an accident, and he is uh, free, just free-falling in space, basically, out of control. They pick him up, and then he he gets debriefed, and he's he's really into it. It's kind of crazy. He doesn't He doesn't have that many reservations about what he was chosen to do. Yeah, he's pretty cool. He kind of even takes, though he's a Spartan and he knows he needs to be fighting. Yeah, I like the the little bit of shock he has when Ackerson reveals this to him, and he's like, "Oh, they they weren't already training the next Spartan class because they've all assumed that Mendez went off and that the next Spartan two class was in production because they've yeah. been like they've been out at war for long enough now, where I suppose they kind of assume like." the next class of Spartan 2s would be close to Done. finishing. Yeah, they'd be close to being ready because I think it's it's been, what, 10 years since the Spartan 2 program wrapped up because I think they say at one point that Mendez has been in active service for for the 10 years in between. So, like, that would, yes. be, that would be almost time to send them out of 15 or 16. So I like that it's a bit of a shock to the system that he suddenly realizes, oh, we were we were literally the last of the Spartans. Kurt gets transferred to twenty five thirty one. Yeah, that's that. That is actually pretty cool. The differences between them that he just sees that like of like holy crap. He just assumed there was more Spartans coming. Yeah, like everyone just assumed and no one realized that the whole program was basically canceled because Halsey was too picky. I mean, that was that was the whole problem. Well, and also Halsey cared about her Spartans so much. We also have to forget. The technology was limited at the time. That it's it's easy to say, but like she was picky for a reason. Do you know what I mean? They had a lot of that's true. You know, their criteria was quite limited, uh, and also the pool of people they could pull from was also limited as well. Because I mean, I think they talk in this book about ex- extending that in different ways, uh, and then like avoiding certain areas like the outer colonies because they might rebel if they think you're snatching children or snatching people, and that's why they go for orphans in this one, isn't it? Well, they want. They also wanted. They wanted a choice. They wanted to give the kids a choice. Yeah, which was kind of interesting when you're taking five-year-olds and four-year-olds and telling them these things. Yeah, because, I mean, five five is not a good age to cons- consent to being in the military their whole lives. But another reason was they picked most of the orphans were orphans of war. A lot of the a lot of Alpha Company came from Harvest. So these kids had a vengeance to them. And I think that's what they wanted. They wanted to feed their vengeance so that it feeds their motivation. Yeah, and like no one would really miss them because who's going to miss the space orphans during the, you know, the war with the Covenant? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do we want to move on to Alpha Company real quick? Yeah, go for it. Alpha Company's sadly tragic. It's like a chapter we have with them. So um, they introduce us to only three of Alpha Company, Shane, Robert, and Jane. And Shane comes from Har- Harvest, and I'm not sure where Robert and Jane come from, but it talks about their very first um, Spartan mission. So they introduce them. They introduce them. They're like, hello, we are on Onyx. You're going to be Spartans. It's time to jump out of a plane. <laughs> uh, that's one of the first things they do with them. And so it's just kind of this sweet chapter about these kids having the will to jump out of out of a plane and doing a free fall with, of course, a parachute. It talks about that, and then it immediately goes to, oh, they all graduated. Yeah. All it's they're all dead. Fast. Oh, the, yeah, exactly. Twenty five thirty seven. All uh, Project Prometheus. All of Alpha Company is lost. It's crazy. And that's a that's a six year turnaround because Kirk transferred in twenty five thirty one, and Project Prometheus was twenty five thirty seven. Yeah, they're they've really like sped up the production timeline on them and like they have a they have a kind of shitty end because it's almost like a weird it's almost like the they end were like of, 11 yeah, yeah it's like the end of reach the game 
it's the same sort of end where it's like last man standing taken out by the elites. That was the vibe I got listening to it the whole time was like they're slowly wiped out as they go. They take massive losses and in the end the whole thing falls apart and the the last couple of Spartans are just wiped out. Yeah. Which is sad. Which is why I have an awful soft spot for the Spartan 3s because they got fucked over so badly. Well, they were made for suicide missions. They were made to be ghosts, basically. No one knew about them. They were supposed to go into these suicide missions and, hey, if they all die, they were really cheap to make, so it's a quick turnaround. Six years is a really quick turnaround time for Spartans. Yeah, and that operation took place over a few days. Do you know what I mean? They just dumped the Spartans there yeah. and let them fight yeah, over a few days. and they work away. And, like, you see what happens with... Because Noble Team are Alpha Company Spartans. So, like, you see what happens when you put Spartans in Mjolnir, or Spartan 3s in Mjolnir? Like, they they did pretty good. Granted, they got a little fucked over too, but no one was coming out of reach in a good way. Whereas these guys yeah. got dumped off in these really shitty, cut-down, crappy camouflage suits of armor and got sent in and just got wiped. It was pretty sad. So, of course, Kurt being... A very fatherly figure at this point. Him and Mendez are very heartbroken over this and immediately go to train the Beta Spartan 3s. And so we're introduced to Tom, Lucy, Min, and Adam, who are the team that we kind of follow with them. Kind of a similar thing happens. They're all happy getting trained. And then Operation Torpedo happens. And only Tom and Lucy survive that one as well. And that one's... That one's attacking the um, the Covenant Plasma Center, kind of the factory. Yeah, Pegasi Delta. And that's a, that's a really cool scene where just all of these ships just show up, and uh, you know the team kind of realizes. Well, all of the all the Spartans realize this is a losing fight, but Tom and Lucy are able to get out and make it to the extraction point. And this is the point where um, Lucy uh, stops talking. Yeah, which is important for like later novels when she shows up again. So Tom and Lucy become pretty major characters. Uh, well, major, but they become like central characters to the Halo lore. So, you know what I mean? They get their own books and all this kind of stuff. So I'd say they become major. They come back in, what is it, Legacy of Onyx? They become pretty much the right-hand men men and women of Kurt yeah. through for a long, long time. Also, funny enough, they become the right and left-hand men of June for the Spartan 4 program. So they've like, they, they end up doing this over and over again. Mm. Uh, after this, Kurt takes them and trains the uh, Gamma Spartans, but they they show up in a lot of different novels, and they just become they become teachers, but they're also very adept in the field as well. They get a lot of really good experience. So, with Gamma Company, we follow Ash, Holly, Mark, Olivia, and Dante. The interesting thing about Gamma Company is Kurt is so heartbroken over losing Alpha and Beta Company that he does an illegal augmentation to Gamma, which becomes very... It doesn't really come up in this book at all. Like, I know Halsey is kind of upset about it, and a lot of people, a lot of different people are upset. Is the augmentation only Gamma? Because I thought it was... It's only Gamma. That's, okay. That's why Noble Team and Tom and Lucy were all able to have Mjolnir armor, because they won't put a Gamma in Mjolnir in case they... Go crazy. Uh, like, freak out. Ah, uh, okay. They're too unstable to get powered armor. And this becomes a major plot point in Last Light. Slight spoiler, but we've covered that already. But um, the Gammas the gammas are slightly mentally unstable. Um, they have this they have this drug that was to augment their brains so that they kind of... Their fight-or-flight response is just fight. It stops them going into shock. I think is what it is. So they can literally... It happens once. Um, is it Dante it happens to? Where he yes, is like... it's Dante. He's brutally injured and he literally keeps going until the second he drops in a pile. Even though he should have been unconscious and on the floor maybe 10 or 15 minutes before that. And so the long-term effects on this is Gamma has to take this this drug to kind of stabilize them or else they kind of get... Almost schizophrenic. I think it's like antipsychotic and anti-schizophrenic drugs they take to... And then that becomes like a big plot point in Last Light. And then they, they kind of write their way out of it in the next book. They do, yeah. This is a highly, highly illegal thing that Kurt did to them. But Kurt thought it would help their survival rate. 
when they mention this when they're in uh, or when they're on Onyx and when Blue Team are there, they they mention how the Spartan threes like make Blue Team uneasy the entire time, and I kind of half wonder is it because Blue Team can sense there's something a little off about like these these gammas. I don't know because Tom and Lucy are there too the whole time, and they're they're wary of Tom and Lucy as well. Hmm. True. Good point. These Spartan threes were not never became as I guess detached as the Spartan twos, um, like emotionally and socially. I think it's kind of because uh, Kurt says at one point he has to train them to be like less of a fire team and more of a family. So that they're like I know the Spartan twos are family, but I kind of feel like the threes are more intimate as a bigger group, and I suppose it helps that there were more of them to begin with. They had like 300 other Spartans to socialize with instead of the like barely 100. Yeah, that's true. I mean, even though still it's more obvious in The Last Light and the books that come after that, they're still socially inept for the most part. You know, there's there's a scene in the bar in one of the other books where the threes are trying to be like the ferret team in creation and they're being trained as to see them act normally. And even that's weird. (laughs) Yeah. While they're better, they're not still not quite normal and i think kurt is just the um, anom- anomaly oh like krista said anomaly Ta-da. yeah but it's cool they're they're an awesome they're they're yeah spartan trees are cool sad but cool they have a very tragic story this whole book like the setup to this book is crazy it's only the last like 50 pages where as- shit actually starts happening on onyx maybe not 50 maybe 100 but the first like half first uh, two-thirds of the book is just setting all this up because after we learn about the Spartan Threes, it immediately switches over to Halsey and what she's doing. Yeah, because Halsey is now going for round two of kidnapping the Spartan Twos. <laughs> Kidnap Spartans. She is two for two on this. She has kidnapped them once. She is now kidnapping them again, and she gives no fucks. Is it Linda she kidnaps, or is it Kelly? Kelly. She just kidnaps Kelly. Kelly. Ke- Kelly's okay. injured at the end of... First light, first strike, which first is one strike, of yeah, first? first strike, yeah. So Kelly was injured, so she grabs Kelly and runs. Yeah. So what she does is she grabs this ship called the Beatrice, and goes to Onyx on a crazy hunch. Yeah, she's kind of pieced together a little bit of what's going on. So she has a rough idea that there's some sort of Spartan program on the go, and she's like, "Right, we can get here." We can trick them. I think, like, her plan seems to be at first, where I'm going to get here, I'm going to round everyone up, we're going to jump on a ship, and we're going to fly off into the galaxy and go as far away from everything as we can. Well, and she also kind of realizes, like, she realizes Onyx is a forerunner world and contains, like, either a crazy technology that'll let them leave or the shield world. She has kind of a hunch that it's a protective place because she sees all the shit going down with the halos. Well, she figure, I think she figures that out once she is there, but like her original plan, I think she says at one point, was just to fly as far away as she could yeah. with whatever Spartan 2s and 3s she had. And then she figures out, oh, there's a shield world. And then she has this moment where she goes, oh, I can trick them into sending blue team here. So she like gets on the... She gets on the slip space telephone to Hood and basically says, like, send Spartans. Well, because at that point, the Sentinels have awoken. So she comes to the planet when the Sentinels are happening and she tells Hood to send a fleet and to send Spartans. So the rest of Blue Team, other than John, so um, Linda, Fred, and Linda, Fred, and Will all show up. Yeah, poor Will. No, oh, poor Will, yeah. Because you, you're, you're kind of listening to this and you're going, oh, there's Blue Team and Will. Mm, I wonder who the red shirt is in this scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something so. cool to mention if you don't or didn't put two and two together in this is everything on Onyx kicks off at the exact moment they cancel the activation of the Halo in Halo 2. Yes. This is the yep. exact moment that it the It all happens hits the in fan. 2552. October 31st, 2552 is when the Sentinels start waking up. So as Johnson and Miranda are killing uh, Tartarus and pulling the key back out and stopping the halo, uh, this all starts and the Sentinels activate and... Start searching for reclaimers. Yeah, and they dive into what becomes like the massive lore eventually of uh, swords and shields in Halo, which is the halos and these uh, Dyson Sphere shield worlds that we've now had two of, three of, two... No, we've had three. Uh, Halo 4 and this one? There's one in Broken Circle as well. Oh, okay. 
and there's the one from Halo Wars that they blew up. So, like, we're getting quite good at shooting oh, worlds yeah. now. Yeah, there was a lot of them, but um, if you remember in the Forerunner trilogy, slight spoiler for this, um, the Forerunners were so overwhelmed by the flood they couldn't get to the shield worlds. Which is the question they, they keep asking, and it's like, where are the Forerunners if they built a shield world? And it seems to be working, yeah. The Halsey stuff is so interesting because she's just, she she knows about what's going on with the Halos. She has a pretty good understanding, at least better than most people do. Most people don't even know about the Halos. So she has a good understanding about the Halos, the Sentinels, and all this stuff. And she immediately writes this off as a losing battle. The battle with the Halos and the Covenant. Which is why she's trying to ra- wrap up all the Spartans, because... One, she has a lot of sen- sentimentality towards the Spartans, but two, she thinks that the Spartans could be the next step for humanity, and if something something happens, it's the only salvation humanity would have is the Spartans. Because the Spartans, like, technically the Spartans could reproduce if they wanted to, they just don't have a sex drive to reproduce. I kind of get the feeling the Spartan 3s would get more jiggy with it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Spar- Spartan 3 seem like they would be the sort of people to go out and drink shots of tequila and do terrible things in nightclubs, whereas the Spartan 2s are just too awkward for their own good. Although they can still, like, we still have Spartan 2s that have reproduced, so possibly, although then you get into weird eugenics territory of Halsey breeding Spartans from Spartans. I mean, it's never explicitly said that that's what she wants to do, but she also sees the next step of humanity in the Spartans, so... Here's a question. If you breed two Spartans, do you make a Spartan or do you make a normal human that you have to You augment? wouldn't make a normal human. I think it would be a normal human. But some yeah. of their augmentations are genetic, aren't they? I don't think so. No... I, I, don't don't know. Know. I thought I thought like the muscle and strength and bone augmentations, I thought some of those were on a genetic level. I've always wondered, like, can don't you breed so. Spartans and make more Spartans? I think they would still need to go through an augmentation process for everything, though. I do, too. I mean, there are some things that might be the same in terms of the blood of the mother and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it'd be weird. They would, they would be able to receive augmentations. Possibly. Yeah, that's. I, I was just kind of. I wondered about that. I was like, because then I thought about not to like diverge slightly, but the only Spartan I think we know of that had children was Randall, who they mentioned in yeah. this. I wanted to say that. Yeah, I totally had forgotten about that. Which is uh, cool. Of three four three to like tie back to that. Although then again, as I think, I think Randall and Kurt are very similar because yeah. like the brief bit we see of Randall later. He seems He's normal. a very human Spartan. He's a very yeah. human, likable character, but he had a daughter, and I always wondered, was his, would his daughter be superhuman in any way? I don't think so. I don't I've... think so. I think that I think that it would just, if the right genetics were passed over, he would be able to receive the genetic augmentations that Halsey gave the Spartan twos. But at this point, like at that point, the um, technology was always already advanced enough that you didn't need to look for a specific gene set to handle the augmentations anyway. I feel like they they kind of, I think with the Spartan 3s, they still have to look a bit. It's just the goalposts are very far apart. And then by the time we get to the 4s, it's like, fuck it, anyone can do it. Your only criteria is, do we think you have what it takes mentally? Which is kind of cool. Although they, they get that wrong sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's move on and let's do a quick segue and talk about Major Vorvo Manticree, which is our Sangheili leader that we kind of get a brief um, brief information about. He came, he saw, he got blown up. Basically, he was on, he was on, um, he was there during the battle of Installation 05, Halo 2, and his leader at the time thought that the Flood's made Forerunners godly and was going to drive the ship onto the ring so that the ship could be infected. So this guy was crazy. And so Vorvo, of course, assassinated him and took over. Which is cool. Yeah. Very cool scene. Because that, that's that's how Sangheili work. Because the, the whole crew were like, what, are you crazy? So, I mean, everybody, everybody immediately starts paying respects to Vorvo and accepts him at the new le- as the new leader. Does anyone remember how he ends up at Onyx? Like, all these people end up in Onyx. Uh, I remember, I can tell you this, but he 
kind of holds off the flood on the halo for a while and then he makes the decision that they have to go and warn the elites so they head off and go to this like elite general who was basically like the next in line to become the arbiter if it hadn't have all fucked up because he was exiled to the outer planets by the prophets so they like go to this guy and they meet up on his ship and they have all these ship masters together and they're trying to form their plan of what they're going to do and then he basically says we, while we were on our way here we came across a brute ship with humans on it which is blue team who've hijacked a ship into earth and they're going to onyx and he's like we need to tr- we figured out where they're going we can track them we need to go and see they intercept what they're doing. a um they intercept a signal right yeah they drop out of slip space prematurely and they're in and this is all in the middle of the great schism by the way so the the brutes and elites are killing each other all over the place so they drop out of uh slip space because it's a brute ship that they have and the brutes that are attacking a sanghili cruiser are thinking that it's help for them and it's not as blue team who immediately just run away well they attack one of the ships but then run away i love the scene where the um the brute shows up on the comms and he's like my brothers we and then he like looks around and sees the spartans he's like oh shit and then immediately turns off the he yeah. gets far too far into his speech before he realizes the the ship's got a load of demons on it because he's just like talking and talking. And then it's like, what the? What, uh? And then they hang up on them again. <laughs> it's really funny. I love that scene. Yeah. So that's how he ended up in Onyx. The the I forget the other elite's name. Basically sends him off and is like, okay, you're now you're now a fleet master. Take your fleet, follow the demons, and go find this planet and see what they're at. And then that general gets wiped out by the very awesome Nova bomb that was left by... Blue team. Oh no, it was left by... Ackerson. No, it wasn't Ackerson. It was a general from Fall of Reach. Remember the general on Fall of Reach that takes command of blue team? And he just like leaves this bomb lying around hoping hoping the coven... Take it home with them and he leaves like this awesome little voicemail on it where it's like to all the covenant something like to all the covenant uglies listening to this you've got a few seconds to live you know uh, it's basically go fuck yourselves and pray to your heathen gods and it's a grunt that activates it isn't it yeah but it's the grunt activates it but it's also the all the engineers that were like putting it back together yeah they were rebuilding it and the grunts listening to the message and then the tablet dies so the elites or the engineers are reattaching it to the bomb and at the exact moment they're reattaching it the grunts like oh fuck i know what this is yeah but he's too late it's pretty great that's a really great scene and then we're introduced to the greatest destructive force in all of halo the Nova bombs are like ridiculous. Because it takes out like a couple fleets, doesn't it? I think it, it takes decimates out the fleets the planet. and decimates a planet and shatters a moon. Jeez. And like the oh, only yeah. other time I know of one of these going off is uh, like minor spoilers. Great team use one to wipe out an elite planet somewhere else. But like these are these are planet killers, which is really ballsy that the UNSC let them put one in the basement of a base in Reach. If it had have gone off accidentally, yeah, yeah, it, uh, it would have made a bit of a mess of the place. I mean, just thinking about the stuff that happened on Reach, though. I mean, what did they have to lose, really? Also, it's Oni. They probably didn't tell everybody that it was there. That's probably. true. They're probably ready to destroy the planet to uh, so that the Covenant couldn't get any of the artifacts and stuff on it. Especially not all the Spartan knowledge and information that would be there. But that problem kind of solved itself with the glassing of the planet. True true let's talk about let's move on to onyx and all the stuff that happens there a good chunk of this is literally just them figure trying to figure out what these sentinels are doing but the sentinels are so cool on onyx they're pretty crazy yeah they're kind of this is obviously way before halo 4 so like we've never seen them before and they're kind of i don't know where do we see sentinels so sentinels are in halo 2 they're in Halo 1. You're right, they're in Halo 1. God, that's stupid. Yeah, but like, yeah, very much so. These remind me of like Promethean tech, the way things don't join together. They just like float. Whereas the Sentinels in 1 to 3, they're mechanical. Like they're they're one thing that moves. Whereas this is, this is a ball and three booms that float around it and they give the Sentinel shape. But they're one object because like at one point... One of the Spartan 2s is a Kelly or Linda stands on one of these booms and like smashes. Yeah, 
Uh, Kelly smashes it to bits. And she smashes it, but like the boom holds her weight and stays attached to the ball, even though they're not physically touching. So they're this weird kind of like, they're kind of like Promethean stuff because it reminded me of the... Pretty much Forerunner tech. Yeah, that kind of like floaty, but it's all one object, even though they're not attached. Yeah, they sound really basic. Do you know what I mean? In terms of what they would look like. These three booms and an eye in the middle, and that's it. As opposed to like how complicated the Sentinels look in all the other games. They sound very basic, but obviously they're a specific type that obviously like, as you say, they join together and create larger structures and larger... um, And like whole shields and stuff, right? Shields and stuff like that, yeah. They've got like, the more of them they get together, the more powerful they are, both defensively and offensively. And they seem to also learn as they go. Well, and at the end of the book, we find out that... This is kind of spoilers for the end of the book, but we find out that Onyx itself is made out of Sentinels. Which is crazy. That like... Oh, it's just yeah. Because at the end, they they form like a Death Star because yeah, they shoot much. all yeah. the Covenant <laughs> ships in this solar system. It's just a Death Star with like terrain on the top. Is basically what this planet is. It's so cool. So so a lot of this is you know blue team interacting with the Spartan threes and being like, "What the hell?" And then they look at Kurt and they're like, "What the hell? You're still here." The reunion that they have with Kurt is pretty sweet. It is. I like that whole. I recognize that voice. No, that can't be him. He's dead. Yeah, it's 20 years, which is crazy to think that the leap. It's also a long. very Spartan reunion. It's like, oh, you're alive. I'm so glad you're alive. Let's do the mission. <laughs> Just like not skipping a beat. Because that's yeah, kind like, of what happened when Blue Team reunited with Master Chief. They're like, oh, hey, it's Master Chief. You survived. Let's go on the next mission. <laughs> Just instantly going into what their work. There is a very interesting almost acceptance that happens through this book between blue team and the spartan threes yeah they all like slowly figure it out and learn to get along together it's i think it's like a it's a testament to kurt that the twos and the threes click pretty quickly like once they kind of have it figured out i think at one point kurt explains it to the twos where he's like look you guys have been on the go for years and these kids are green like they, they haven't been on a single mission yet and they kind of go like Oh, okay, yeah, like, we, we, we need to be, like, the the older brothers to these guys and, like, keep them alive. Yeah. And they do a really good job. Yeah, which is where they go with, like, Last Light. Like, for a while, Blue Team basically adopt most of these Spartan 3s that are left. And then, they like, they, they form a pretty good bond for a long time. So I, th- I think it's, like, cool that as they go along, they all, like, settle in and they just appreciate each other as soldiers. That's a pretty major thing for Spartans as well, to accept another another batch of Spartans as Spartans, which is kind of where the the book leaves off. It leaves off of them becoming a big family because, yeah. you know, Halsey and Mendez show up and they're kind of tagging along with everyone as well. And Halsey's figuring out everything. She figures out how to teleport them around the planet, kind of figures out what they need to do next, figures out that through the whole thing, she calls it a cache in the core. There's a cache of Forerunner artifacts. So she's kind of slowly leading them to this cache, which... I'm not sure when she figures out that it's a shield world, but she figures out it's a shield world and has stuff in it that could be useful, but also would be the best place for her Spartans. She just figured out she could lock them in it, and that was that. As we're talking about the shield world in the core of the planet. So there's a Dyson Sphere in the core of the planet. The only reason why it's open right now and the Sentinels are going crazy is because they want to make sure only Reclaimers or Forerunners get to the, to the shield world and not any flood or anything crazy like that. Yeah. So they're supposed to destroy any anomalies. Only reclaimers, everything else must be destroyed. Or captured for study. Because I think that's what happens to Gladius. Saber team. Is it Gladius or Katana? No, it's, oh, it's Katana. Katana. It's Katana. It's Katana. Gladius we never hear from again, so we're presuming that they're dead. Uh, especially yeah, they the just kind of blows up at the end of this book, so like that's it. And then you have Saber, the remains of them are pretty much... Um, Tom and Lucy. I don't know. We've never had any. No, Saber were the ones, or the Saber, yeah. Katana, we never see again, do we? We never hear any mention. I was of them. going to ask that. They're still in the pods, so they're presumably safe, but I'll have to read Glasslands again um, when we get there and keep an I eye out for them. I don't think Katana ever come back out of the pods, but I can't remember if they address it specifically. Well, the different difficult thing about the pods is that. They're, they're slip space pods, which means they're almost in like a quantum superposition, which means 
you can see them in the pods and they're there, but they're also somewhere else. So they exist in two places at once. Yeah, I think in Glasslands, because uh, Glasslands takes place following Blue Team and that inside the sphere, I think the engineers might tell them that they're too badly hurt and they need a life worker to heal them. And that's why they, I think that's why they leave them in the pods then, because I think they reveal in that that the engineers put them in pods because they were too badly injured. They need like a life worker to repair them. And we'll we'll get to that once we go through Glasslands, because it's going to be really nice. Because I've never read Ghost of Onyx and went straight to Glasslands, so it's going to be really interesting to do that. That's going to be a couple months from now because we got a couple new books coming out. But the whole reason that the the whole reason that the Shield World and the Sentinels are going crazy is because the Halo rings are on standby and they almost got fired. And so there's a limited amount of time that they can get to the core of the planet and it'll still be open for them. Slowly closing because eventually you want it to close and no one to come back in. Yeah, it all it seals up and then this core of the planet, like I think they say, Halsey tells them, it's the size of a basketball in the real world but it's basically the size of Earth's entire orbit on the inside. I think it's the the distance between the Earth and the Sun, right? That's what she said, yeah. It's- Which I think is also the the size of the lesser arc as well in Halo 3. I think the That's arc right, is actually, that big yeah. as well. So it's interesting that so many things are the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But isn't that like the Goldilocks? That's the Goldilocks zone. That why? That's yeah, the thing. That's why. It's the optimum you know, distance for human life which yeah uh, as we said we're we've been identified now as reclaimers so it makes sense that the technology is geared towards humans being able to use it and yeah. humans being able to live comfortably in the zone it's cool to see how this was thought out that this was going to be the plan that they would be sealed in this little like tiny dyson sphere that's actually a giant dyson sphere and then locked away in slip space where the flood couldn't reach them which i imagine it's the slaughter the flood is supposed to starve itself to death maybe yeah well they would either starve themselves to death or the halos would fire yeah well the dyson sphere exists outside of normal space time so the halos could fire and they would be fine yeah so this was once the halos are put on standby someone fires off the halos from the arc which is outside of their range and then everyone else goes into the Dyson spheres to yeah. avoid the um, avoid the blasts, which is super cool uh, concept. I oh, love it. It's amazing. I'm I'm so glad they added this the sword and the shield concept to Halo. But we are getting towards the end of our journey. So the next thing they do once they get inside the planet, and the Covenant, of course, show up and start attacking with um, Vorvo. Can we mention one thing before we go into the planet when they take out the? sentinel production factory at like the north yes, pole yes that's of what the i was planet. gonna go into next ah the sentinel pro- like i kept trying to read the description of this over and over again because it's just so it's hard to picture in your brain like most forerunner stuff when it's described to you it's like i really struggled to visualize what it actually looks like so the room itself is they can't even see the ceiling and there's like clouds in it right for me it's yeah. ginormous yeah and that's You'd imagine it's a production facility for Sentinels that are just, and there's thousands of them in the process. And I think it's like every six seconds, it's pumping out a Sentinel. Well, uh, also like, the cloud, the clouds above them weren't actually clouds. They were just the hordes sentinels. of Sentinels. And the thing they mentioned is there's, the only three things I can picture in this is there's a giant fountain of molten metal spraying into yes. like a receiver. There's a giant pyramid of hard sentinels. light full of ice. And it was, like, bigger bigger than the Pyramid of Giza, like, many times bigger than that? Yeah, and then there's, like, some sort of conveyor belt with a super bright light, conveniently, that you can't see into. And when the Sentinels go in one side, they come out the other side complete. And that's, like, And then they go up to the picture. top of the room. Yeah, and then they wait and uh, do whatever they're doing. But, yeah, the thought that, like, they could make a new Sentinel every six seconds is... It's it's insane. And so the whole concept of them attacking this facility is because there's a huge battle going on between a UNSC battle group and uh, Mas- Major Vorvo's uh, fleet. So they're battling it out, but they're having trouble getting to each other because the Sentinels keep showing up. They can't get close to the planet. So the UNSC fleet is hiding behind a moon. So they ask the Spartans to take care of the Sentinel facility. What do they call the AI that sets all this up? Uh, Endless Summer? He's like a Endless native, Summer. He's like this Native American personaed AI, I think. 
Yeah. Because they have like, they go through three or four AIs, don't they? So it's Eternal Spring, Deep Winter, and Endless Summer, which are amazing names. Holy shit. Yeah, Jared. Yeah, Jared. Oh, there's Jared. Because Eternal Spring's the one that didn't really want anything to do with the Spartans. Endless Summer was super duper attached to the Spartans. And then you end up with... Deep Winter? The Native American one is um, is Endless Summer. Endless Summer. Deep Winter was the old man who was attached and and bring to Kurt's attention the um, augmentations that happened to Gamma. That's right. Then it turned out it was Kurt who did him. That was a cool little twist as well, by the way. I like that. I, kn- I didn't see that coming when I first read it. I'm like, oh shit, they messed up. The- Someone messed up the Spartans. And Kirk's like, it was me all along. <laughs> Which I'd, I'd forgotten about too. And I thought that was fascinating. That it was him who did that. It was cool. It's a cool little twist. And I also liked, they don't really mention it too much after this book, I don't think, the micro AI that uh, Halsey has. Yes. Yeah, I don't think Gerard, they mention right? him at all yeah. in Glasslands. Like, no, I, think I think he just he dies, disappears completely. He? No, he's still there in her computer. They just never bring him up. It, technically, he's there in her laptop. I just, I don't think they ever she's mention him. He's basically a calculator for her, though, because she's yeah, like, I, just, I can't be bothered to do that. Yeah, he's kind of what I imagine uh, Halsey's version of Alexa is. Yeah, like a little PA. <laughs> He's not super smart like Cortana, but I think yeah, it's kind yeah. of cool that they have this little portable AI that will never die. Yeah, that just kind of can do basic um, algorithms and stuff for her that she doesn't want to work out by herself is basically what he does this whole time. And then he's kind of sassy and then Halsey always out sasses everyone. So, all right, we're almost at an hour, so we got to wrap this up. So do we want to just go to the final battle near the core? Yeah, well, you can just talk about Essentially, the fleet show up, the UNSC fleet gets devastated in space. They get fucked over something serious. They're just about to win, too. They do a really good job of fighting the fleet that's there originally, and then reinforcements show up and decimate them. So, like, in Reach, where George takes out one carrier, and they think, oh, yeah, And then a million more and then show boom, up, yeah. The whole armada shows up, so something similar happens here, which is, like, super depressing, because that, like, blanking on his name, the general who was there... Yeah, gets he gets click clacked. Really. Uh, Admiral Rich is that? Yeah, Admiral Rich. So like he, ha- him, and the Prowler are like in space trying to like do re- doing a really kind of cool cool job in space of like def- or attacking and holding up this fleet. Their plan is pretty cool. They have completely pulled it off and they have succeeded. They're like running down the last two ships. They're gonna win. They're actually gonna take everyone out because I think the guy, the like ops guy on the prowler says, Oh, they've got six max ra- six mac rounds left. That's more than enough to finish this. And then suddenly it's like, Oh shit. That's not enough. Yeah. And I like that the 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 Covenant reinforcements like slip space between the humans and the two ships that they're chasing and just like mow them down with a solid field of fire and that's it they're just like all gone except for the prowler who's there to the the very end yeah he is i think he escapes i think he witnesses the um honestly rich is there just so that we have an eye in in the sky when onyx blows up Yes, so we know what happened at the end. Blue Team's been carrying around a couple nukes with them the entire time, as Blue Team does. They're just carrying it like Master Chief on their butts. Something really interesting. So they're at the core, they're fighting off, they're trying to get inside the core and get as many... They're they're basically biding their time just until the entrance to the Shield World is almost closed so they can get in, and the Covenant can't. I like the setup they have with this is they have this hill in the middle. This is where the door is. It's in the top of this. It looks like a tower with layered levels, but the tower is slowly sinking down to the ground as it slots into place. So the closer they get to sailing time, the less of an advantage they have because they're slowly losing like their high ground as they hold off the Covenant. And also just the attack the Covenant do with like all of the elites having the jackal shields and just like slowly, slowly marching towards them with the hunters in the back. Yeah, it's cool the way to see all the different forces at play. They're like suicide grunts, mortar teams, and then they phase in then with like, they bring in banshees, all this kind of stuff. And then you have the, sta- I think the standard awesome Linda scene of her sniping pilots out of banshees. So um, yes. that, that's, that's always cool. And they do this like they do this covenant phalanx with the shields, even though none of the elites are happy about it. Yeah, they don't they don't like using the non superior tech. When they're in the middle of that fight, and one of the you know, some of the elites aren't doing what they're told, and one of the hunters just crushes them with a shield. Yeah, 
and all of the others fall back into line. You see hunters in this book in a totally different light where they're portrayed as way more tactically thinking and like way more, I don't know. They're like, very obedient too. Yeah, very, very sentient. Yeah, I would never have imagined a hunter being put in charge of elites. I would have always assumed it was the other way around. Yeah, very much so. I would have thought that they're more docile and more like you point and shoot. Do you know what I mean? Tell the hunter to go kill the thing and then it does that thing as opposed to it helping maintain battlefield coherency and like actually marshal the units together when they break ranks and stuff like that. It's like, it's not something I don't think we've even seen it that much since then. No, we haven't. We haven't seen hunters take such an important role in a battle. They're mostly yeah. just there to just crush things. Now, I know the Halo Wars 2 hunters are like slightly different. So there's a whole thing over there where they're actually doing more. They're like a commander. That's a that's true they have the, they have like the big hunter in charge um i like how they also point out in this that active camo elites and armor is super rare because in this entire fleet they didn't have one yeah because that's the cool, ship actually. master I never, mentions yeah, I as like i would give up all of my hunter powers just to have one elite with active camo yeah just to go behind and because you kind of assume like all elites come with active camo like it just you know you walk around a ship you think to hear it all the time that everyone just has active camo everywhere constantly they kind of do do you know in in many cases especially in halo 2 when you play as the arbiter and stuff like that all your team and even grunts they all go invisible do you know what i mean so there's i think it's special teams that have it true aren't they like special forces that's true actually yeah you're right because at this point in the battle, they're still kind of scr- like they have a fleet, but they're kind of scrambled with the Halo stuff going on and the Brute stuff going on. So it would make sense for them to not have the right equipment. True. So they, they're able to break the lines of elites. Will, Will gets uh, pretty badly click clacked by a hunter. Like you can feel it too when you're reading that scene and he just gets just pounded by this hunter. You're like, oh shit. Right before that, Dante dies, so he's one of the Spartan trees, so he gets, like, a pretty much ne- uh, plasmid and needled into his chest, and he pretty much fights on until, the like, the first wave of enemies is dead, and then he pretty much salutes and dies, and he's just, like, inside him, like, the obviously the needles. We always forget how brutal the needlers actually are against human flesh. Um, do you know what I mean? they explode ex- inside? They explode, so, like, he, he's, like, his ribs and everything was all exposed, and he was just, like, that's it, dead as soon as he hit the ground. And then you have the cool moment, which is described so awesomely well. Oh no, where I know what you're going to mention. Will charges and fights two hunters in hand-to-hand combat. And like the elites are just stunned watching yeah. this awesome thing happen. And I'm like, that is so cool that like even them are like, holy shit. Will went out in a blaze of glory. Holy shit. He did. That's not what you were going to mention. I thought you were going to mention Per Holly's death. Holly? Yeah, Holly. Well, Holly's came came after that. Yeah, all she's left with in the end is two foot marks on the ground, two footprints. That's all that's left of Holly. She takes a yeah. direct hit, and since like there, it's SPI armor, not Milner. So like Will took a direct hit with a from a fusion cannon, and he died. She takes a double hit as well. I think both of them hit her at the same time. Okay, yeah. she ju- she jumps in front of Linda and Kelly. I'm pretty sure and takes the hit for them. Yep. And just is gone. Vaporizes. It's crazy. So this 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 battle's really amazing. And so towards the end of the battle, when they start sending people through the portal, a bunch more elites just show up. And of course, the um, uh, Vorvo shows up in you know the gold elite armor and starts uh starts commanding the true army. And so at this point, Kirk's Kurt just says, "Give me the nukes. Start getting through the thing." So he starts sending all the Spartans through, and of course, no one wants to go. And he he tells them, like, oh, I'll be in right behind you. Yeah, and Kurt has, important to mention, Kurt has taken a swipe from one of the hunters at this stage, and the hunter has basically sliced his insides open across his, like, chest. Because he's wearing SPI armor. He doesn't wear Mjolnir armor through this whole thing. Yeah, he's pumped full of, like, uh... Biofoam. Biofoam, yeah. Yeah, so he's going to die. Yeah, he mentions how he pumps the biofoam into himself and he has to close his eyes and like hold his breath while he feels the foam ooze in round his organs. I was like, yeah. oh, no. But Halsey pretty much makes the assessment of you're going to die unless I operate you, operate on you right now. And then obviously it's a case of that's not going to happen in the middle of a battle. So yeah. he knows he's gone. So what he does is he they set up they set up the nukes 
Um, everyone gets through the other side of the portal, and as the portal closes, he's lying on the ground, basically bleeding out, dying. Vorvo comes up and starts talking to him, and he basically says, you know, die, you son of a bitch, and then blows the nukes at the core of the planet. And we get the amazing scene of Onyx just collapsing, and then you realize Onyx is made out of sentinels. Just the whole inner sphere of Onyx is just this crazy, like, amalgamation of sentinels that all and then explode it turns at once. Into like a, it, no, it turns into like a space laser disco ball because it shoots out sentinel beams through the system and kills all of the Covenant ships and then, like, detonates. And I think the Prowler escapes just before the moon explodes because they're yeah. hiding. I don't know on, like, if the, the moon explodes, side. but before the shockwave of the all the tectonic plates and actions being detonated. Uh, that's that's coming to hit the moon, so they go to slip space right before that. So I don't think the moon may not. In the midst of a covenant armada, by the way, they they power up. They go to slip space right in the middle of all this covenant stuff. But he kind of he kind of says, "Well, everyone's so um, distracted by this this explosion that they're not going to notice us." The covenant are being wiped out at this stage. Like the beams are vaporizing cruisers and battleships by the by the handful. I think at this point, so like the the covenant are pretty fact at this stage then we cut to blue team the red the remains of blue team the spartan threes mendez and halsey looking around the dyson sphere and having a funeral for the spartans that fell will holly and dante and then immediately immediately blue team are like okay we gotta go scout and halsey's like there's nothing to do anymore yeah and also there's an important thing that happens at the end which you don't really realize it but it is mentioned in later books uh fred gets a field promotion that puts him yes. as the highest ranking Spartan in the field, I think. Which makes him leader. Which makes him the leader. And I think it's interesting because later on, uh, Blue Team meet up with John and Fred immediately defers to John, even though he's a higher rank than him. And he doesn't really care. Do you know what I mean? I think he makes... I think there's an interesting comment of Fred just falling into line with John as yeah. opposed to... Like, just cause, and that's just how they revere him, which is cool. So the Dyson Sphere is interesting because you can, instead of like, instead of the normal, normal planet you stand on where the horizon curves downward, it curves upward like you're inside a ball. Which is the best way to think about it. Yeah, you're inside a ball that has a, that has surface in it. And in the center is a sun. Yes, an artificial sun as well, because the Forerunners are big on their artificial suns. So um, this Dyson Sphere is, of course, outside the realm of normal space, so it was unaffected when Onyx blew. And it is cr- incredibly huge, and now the Spartan 2s, Spartan 3s, Halsey and Mendez are just stuck here. They have no idea how to escape. They have Team Saber with them, and they just have just an, just an infinite, not infinite, but they have a huge area to cover, many times bigger than Earth. It's millions of, uh, I think they mention it in Last Lands, or if not Legacy of Onyx, but it's millions of Earth's worth of land. Yeah, to like, cover. It's just, and I, it's so, so giant. You, like, they'll never, humanity will never explore it as long as they live. At least this generation, but... That's kind of where we leave off. And what I find so interesting about Ghosts of Onyx is because, like, everyone's wondering, where did all the Spartan goes, like, during the games? You're like, where are the other Spartans? Where are they? What? Why aren't they here? Why aren't they helping Chief? And then this kind of gives a answer. I mean, during the end, the end of Halo 2 and the beginning of Halo 3, they are, they're trapped. They can't do anything. And this kind of goes into the point between Halo 3 and 4 is when we, when we kind of see more of this unfold. Blue Dreams trapped there pretty much until like just pre halo 4 yes yeah yeah it's that it's that weird time between the covenant war ending and master chief waking up closing thoughts trivia what do we want to talk about there's a few bits and pieces in there i mean i guess a lot of it's kind of i forgot and i just kind of never really thought about it um i didn't really realize Glasslands, it was like an official follow-up to this, as opposed to like, and it was even supposed to be Eric Nyland at some stage who wrote it, and did, but they were they were saying it was in talks around 2010, and the follow-up novel was to be announced on July 20th, 2010, and despite early talks with Island, it was confirmed to be written by Karen Travis, which was a newcomer to the Halo thing at the time, and um, she was an award-winning novelist and author of Human Weakness, which is a short story in Halo Evolutions, which had probably come out, I think, at the time. I think at that stage she had done like two or three of the Gears books, so she was probably like well in with Microsoft. And I think also I think it's well known that Eric Nyland 
didn't really want to do anymore. I think he, he's not have too much with Halo anymore, so maybe he wasn't around or available to do to do the, the tie-in or the follow-up. But it's kind of interesting that when it did come out, which is the 25th of, of October 2011, uh, which is many years, like we said, after 2006, when the original book came out, that it took that long to get the follow-up sequel of where all these characters were. We had like a long time just waiting, wondering. I might be wrong. Aren't these the first books that came out under the 343's watch? Was the Karen Travis books? The Forerunner book, books and the Karen Travis books were kind of their first books that came out. Because for a while there, we didn't really... We had kind of this dark period between Evolutions and uh, these three tr- trilogies where we didn't get any book. It was, I suppose it was the handover period between Bungie and 343. So everything was kind of quiet. And then they like launched back into this with ending one of the biggest cliffhangers. And then a few years later, they go on to like answer the Grey Team cliffhanger. That's almost every cliffhanger in Halo because they've done the Forerunner stuff as well. So the only thing left is to answer where the Sentinels went in Halo 3. Well, we're we're at a really good place in Halo book-wise. We have a lot of information, a lot of cool stories going on. We do. And I personally, like, the the way this is dealt with later with the Kilo 5 books, I'm kind of happy they went the way they did because it, from the sounds of it, Eric Nyland wasn't going to do a trilogy. It was just going to be one book and that was it. And I'm much happier that we got the Kilo 5 books out of it. Yes. Yes. Mm. Because they go places after this. Like it, It's only Glasslands that really wraps this up and then the other two books go off on their own and then we get Last Light and that that carries these characters on again. It's very nice that this huge cast of characters got multiple novels. Yes, they didn't just like drop them and dispose of them and... And they're still going today. Spoilers. They are like spoilers. They're all still alive and still well. Yeah, it's cool. So this is this is probably one of the best best Halo books out there because it establishes so much for the rest of the books here on out. It, again, it's an um, Eric not in the classic where his books are still influential now. They're still well loved. I think Ghost Onyx is kind of a quiet one because people always talk about Halo Reach a lot more. I mean, I think First Strike and this book get overshadowed a little bit. I think this book's probably there right behind Fall of Reach. I feel like if I hear people... I think so too. I think the one people overlook is First Strike. I feel like that's the one people tend to forget about. Because a lot of people mention either Fall of Reach or Ghost of Onyx as their favorite Halo book. Yeah, and then they kind of like mention Contact Harvest and uh, Cold Protocol in the same breath because they don't deal really with Blue Team. So they're like, oh, there's those other two good books and then there's Fall of Reach and Ghost of Onyx. And then First Strike, like I don't. It's an awesome book, so I don't think they deliberately forget about it. It's not like the flood, where everyone mentions the flood and everyone goes, "Ugh." <laughs> it's not that bad. Eventually, we're gonna cover it. No, the flood's all right. It's just it's just a retelling. Yes, no one was really craving for a novelization of the game. Uh, yeah, I mean, flood. I know we're not okay. I'm not saying anymore about the flood. It gets a bad rap, but it does more things than the than just being a novelization of the game, which I really appreciate. And I think Fireteam Raven feeds into that a good bit too, which kind of fleshes that out a bit. That's true. What I will say, before we wrap up, a few other bits of trivia that I thought were interesting. It is apparently, it had an original name called Ghosts of Corral, which is supposed to be raised much speculation around the Isle of Bees significance to the Halo series, as Corral is a planet featured in that alternate reality game, which I never knew about. Um, while it was called the Ghosts of Corral, Two chapters were apparently cut from the novel for pacing reasons, and apparently none had actually wanted a desire to release those chapters, but obviously it never happened. Um, I don't know if Onyx had a definitive edition, but it was rumoured to have one at some stage that a, uh, a reissue would, would occur. Did, I think did it that's actually the get re-releases a... coming out this year. Really? A lot of them are getting re-released. They're get the the original seven books are getting reprints this year. Chris posted about it in the Facebook group. They're or listings on Amazon in a few places. I don't think they've done anything to it. Well, at the minute, it doesn't seem like it. It's just a reprint. Yeah, okay, that's cool. I'm hoping that they'll either come out with a huge box set with all of these books, and I hope they're normal size instead of these teeny tiny books. Didn't they do <laughs> a box set of the... S- did they only do a box set of the three, or did they do a box set of the original seven? No, they only did a box set of the first three books, the Master Chief Trilogy. By the way, I've also just realized seven books for Bungie. That's a little annoying that they managed to get a seven in there. 
<laughs> they always have to get a seven in there. <laughs> I'm slightly angry about that now. Two different book cover uh, on the back for Ryan's one with a Spartan and SPI armor and another with a Spartan two and Mjolnir armor. That's it. Also, oh, Camp Curry is most likely a reference to a real world Camp Dakota, which is a training area for the 101st Airborne Division during World War II. It was located near Currie Mountain in Georgia. It was popularized in the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers, if you remember. And Kurt 051's pseudonym Ambrose is likely a reference to Stephen E. Ambrose, who is the author of the original book that the miniseries was based off. Oh, that's kind of cool. Isn't it? Yeah. So that's probably about it. And, And that's pretty much it, everybody. Oh, the cover of the novel depicts what has since been established as the Eld. So that's a foreigner glyph for the mantle. That was under the ghost, the title of Ghost of Onyx, which is interesting. Oh. I don't think that made that. I was, never was noticed that teased. until I read that. Like the night I was doing the notes for this, I was like, "Wait, there, there's a forerunner symbol," and then I had to go and pull up a picture and be like, "Oh, there it is." Yeah. I'm gonna have to look at my go. book. There you go. Uh, any last words, guys? Really awesome book. Really like, it. even though it's as old as it is, it still stands up. It's still really great. I mean, everyone should know who Kurt is and his significance. He's a marvelous character. Um, unfortunate death, but obviously he died like a Spartan too. Total hero, sacrificed himself, blowing up some nukes and taking a ridiculous amount of um, covenant with him. He's pretty much the star of this book. I think I love Halsey and she shows a bit of weakness here and you get to see she has a kind of crazy face uh, as Halsey in terms of like her plan is ridiculous. You know, let's just steal Spartans and go hide and you kind of think, oh, that sounds awful, but like it's how it, what, what what happens as she goes Mendez great shadow I love that character uh, I do love that guy other than that the Spartan 3s are a great addition to the to the universe I like how they've been integrated I like where all, all the different authors took them in a different way and how they built the fairy team and stuff like that all that came from this originally which is like I said an old book and also Dyson's fairies are amazing Aaron oh god I think David's kind of covered all that um, I don't think there's much else really to say it's an, yeah, like you said it's an awesome book I love the characters I like that it eventually went on to make one of my favourite trilogies it set it up and mm, I, I think that's kind of like, like it's an awesome book it's a great one to read it's up there with Fall of Reach and that's about it like there's nothing else really it's just really good like there's no real yeah. complaints with this novel it's not very often we have absolutely nothing to complain about I feel like <laughs> there's usually there's usually something that we all have that rubs us the wrong way in a novel but like this one i can't think of anything all right oh sorry i do want to give a shout out to the fact that 343 are much better with their audiobooks now because there are numerous <laughs> pronunciations in this audiobook that are wrong Uh oh, like cringy who did the audiobook for this the audiobook for this was Ewan Morton. Okay. He did all of the he did all of the original books. He did the narration for oh, them. I think he not was that generation. Yeah. yeah. He didn't do Contact Harvest. But numerous times in this audiobook they call the UNSC the U S N C. See, I can't even say it. It's automatic. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. But that's terrible. They, there numerous times they do that and they pronounce the brute name wrong and the elite name wrong, but sometimes they pronounce them right, which is weird. Yeah, sometimes it's inconsistent, but mostly it's wrong. That would never happen on Jeff's watch. Never. No, it yeah. would never happen on 343's watch, which is something I've really come to appreciate that they always get it right. They really teach them the pronunciation because it's nice to have a universal pronunciation for all these crazy names. Yeah, it kind of it makes me appreciate it because like with the older Bungie books, there are quite a lot of mistakes in some of them. Like, we've had re-releases and re-definitive editions and tweaked dates and details editions and some of these audiobooks. I think this is the worst offender. I haven't noticed anything as bad with the others. I just wanted to say that because I was immediately reminded of it when I started playing the book. I was like, what's the use the the USNC? USNC? And I'm like, what the <laughs> What the fuck is that? Because I had to rewind it three times to be like, am I imagining this? Did he say that? It's like, no, he did. He did. Okay. Well, for me, I think that this and Fall of Reach are definitive building blocks to the Halo universe, universe and thus so, like, have to be read to understand all of the other books and all of the other stuff that comes after this. Onyx or the Shield World in Onyx becomes such a huge player 
in the Halo universe, the Halo Extended universe, that you have to have this base knowledge of what happened here, who the Spartan 3s were, where the Spartan 2s went, and all of this to really understand what's going on in these next couple books and the next couple um, additions to the series, and also just knowing who Blue Team is, like, between Fall of Reach and Ghost of Onyx, you really get to know Blue Team, which is very important for Halo 5, so. Oh, yeah. Very good book. Love it. Read it. If you haven't read it and you've listened to this, we've spoiled everything, but it's still worth reading, because we cannot get all of the details in a hour-long book club, but Thank you much. Thank you so much for listening, Spartans. We appreciate it. Go check us out on Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. We have an amazing Discord where you can keep talking lore and keep asking questions and someone will answer. <laughs> so I think the next book we're going to be doing next month is Battleborn, which is the new release. Start reading that. It's going to be the interesting graded T for teen book, basically. So young Ooh. adult book. So it'll be interesting to see how Halo is portrayed through teenagers. Thank you so much for listening to to us and evolved. Evolved. <laughs>